we're happy to have uh, Dr. Elizabeth Schmidt from Loyola University come and visit us today. Uh, we've had to reschedule it for snow days, so I want to thank Dr. Schmidt for her, for her patience on that. Uh, Dr. Schmidt received her PhD in African History from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, today she will discuss her most recent publication, Foreign Intervention in Africa, The Cold War Legacy in Contemporary Africa. Uh, foreign Intervention in Africa chronicles the foreign political and military interventions in Africa during the periods of decolonization, the Cold War, as well as during the periods of state collapse and the global war on terror. Uh, please join me in offering Dr. Schmidt a warm Naval Academy welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. Um, thank you, everyone. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, and. Um, um, yeah, I, I figured since the, my lecture uh, was originally scheduled for a day where the Naval Academy was closed with snow, just to make myself feel more at home, I'd bring a little more snow with me today. Um, <laughs> but at any rate, um, I'm glad that it wasn't canceled. And um, uh, today what I'm going to do is talk about the basic premises of a book that I wrote that was published last year. Um, it's actually, the book is actually called Foreign Intervention in Africa from the Cold War to the War on Terror. Um, but what I'm going to focus on today is the Cold War legacy in contemporary Africa, hence the, the title of the lecture. Um, it's a little bit difficult to give this talk because if I give you the broad parameters of the book, the outline of the argument, um, I'm going to fall short on providing a lot of detail of the case studies, which may be exactly what you want to hear about. Um, and so I'll tell you what countries I cover in the case studies um, as I begin. Uh, but then I'll, I'll, I'll proceed with the general argument of the book. And then um, at the end, I, I'm going to leave about 10 minutes. So I think this is done at 12, uh, 120, correct? So I'll, I'll stop at least by 10 after so that you can ask me questions. And feel free to ask questions about uh, some of the particulars of the, of the countries and the foreign interventions, not just you know, the arguments of the book, if, if you'd like. So. Um, um, the the um, book, this is the cover of the book, um, not the map, but this, this picture. Um, these are Soviet MiGs in Angola um, that um, uh, was the um, sort of um, t the territory of foreign intervention um, from the 1970s through the 1990s. Uh, and uh, this is an Angolan soldier um, who was the beneficiary of these MiGs. Um, there are a variety of other uh, um, pictures in the book. But the book examines the historical roots of contemporary conflicts and exposes the consequences of foreign political and military intervention in African affairs. One of the purposes of the book was to try to challenge many of the myths that are popular in the West that blame Africans exclusively for their current plight and to understand the role of foreign intervention in creating some of the situations that are present today. This isn't to blame foreigners exclusively for Africa's current problems, and I want to stress that, but rather to look at some of the ways in which foreign intervention has played on local dynamics and local conflicts and exacerbated some of the tensions uh, and how foreign weaponry has um, escalated the conflicts and made them more lethal. Um, now, the, fo the focus of, of the case studies um, um, includes um, the period of decolonization in the Cold War. And for, those, uh, for that particular period, I look at the cases of Egypt and Algeria in North Africa. I look at the Belgian Congo, which is currently the Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, mm -hmm. uh, for a period of time from 1971 to 1997. It was called Zaire. <laughs> Um, the Portuguese colonies, uh, specifically what is now Guinea-Bissau, Angola, and Mozambique. Uh, the white-ruled countries of Southern Africa, that would have been South Africa uh, under apartheid. Rhodesia, which was also a, a white settler colony, which later became Zimbabwe. And Namibia, which at one point was called Southwest Africa and was occupied by apartheid South Africa. The uh, next case study is on the Horn of Africa, looking at Somalia, Ethiopia, and Eritrea. And then the, the final decolonization and Cold War case is a little bit different in that it covers um, former French colonies 
in many parts of West and Equatorial Africa. So it's touching on lots of different colonies where France um, retained very strong political, economic, and military ties and intervened dozens of times in the internal affairs of these countries over um, the, the period from independence in the 1960s through the 1990s and even currently today. Um, after focusing on uh, decolonization in the Cold War, the book focuses uh, a, a little bit on the post-Cold War period, the period sometimes people refer to as a period of state collapse. And for that period, I look at uh, uh, very briefly at case studies for Liberia, Somalia, Sudan, and Zaire. And then finally, um, I wrap up with a glimpse at the beginnings of the War on Terror. Um, and focus especially on the Horn of Africa and East Africa and the Western Sahel. Um, so as I said, I'm not going to give you lots of details about those cases, but rather focus on the broad arguments of the book. Um, now these are the historical periods that I just mentioned. Um, basically, the, the book covers 1945 to 2010, but not e giving equal time to all of the periods. Um, the, the, the largest focus of the book is on decolonization and the Cold War. And as you can see from the dates, these are overlapping periods. Um, um, decolonization, the Cold War beginning obviously uh, in 1945, some of course would argue even before the end of World War II, um, and ending with the collapse of the Soviet Union. And decolonization, again, very uh, iffy in terms of the dates uh, because African territories gained independence at different points, most in the 1960s, uh, but some 1975 and even later. Um, and then the period of state collapse, um, again, um, many people would disagree on the exact time demarcation, but um, the post-Cold War period to the beginning of the War on Terror, and then the War on Terror, now under a different name, is still ongoing. So these are this, uh, there are four central propositions in my book. Um, the first is that as colonial systems faltered, imperial and Cold War powers vied to control the decolonization process. Now the imperial powers, and by that I mean the European powers that had colonized Africa, um, hoped to transfer the reins of government to neo-colonial regimes that would continue to serve their political and economic interests. So in other words, there was political independence, but the ties of dependency re remained, uh, and, and, and especially in the economic realm. Um, Cold War powers, in contrast to the former imperial powers, were trying to establish a new world order in which they would be the dominant powers. So even though the United States was allied with many of the Western European nations through NATO, it was not in an uneasy relationship with those countries as decolonization <coughs> proceeded, because on the one hand, it wanted to hurry up the process so that the United States would have access to free trade and resources and could compete um, um, more easily with the Soviet Union in this, in this new terrain. So there, there was an uneasy, uneasy relationship there. Um, Independent struggles and their aftermath were dominated by local issues, for sure. And this book does not focus a great deal on those local issues, but that's the backdrop. Nonetheless, Cold War intervention rendered the conflicts more lethal and the consequences longer lasting. So that's the first proposition. Secondly, um, as the Soviet Union collapsed and the Cold War ended, African nations were essentially abandoned by their Cold War allies. They were left with a legacy of enormous debt, collapsed states, and deadly competition for the spoils. Indigenous pro-democracy movements, which now had some freedom to operate, um, challenged warlords and autocrats for, to fill, fill the power vacuum. Foreign actors during this period of the 1990s both helped and hindered their efforts. So depending on the case study, depending on the foreign actor. Neighboring states and regional, continental, and transcontinental organizations supported opposing sides. So it's not just a free-for-all between uh, local states 
um, and um, extra continental powers like the imperial powers or the Cold War powers, but now neighboring African states have gotten involved in trying to uh, wrest control of resources and power in their own neighbors. Regional organizations sometimes got involved in that. Sometimes were engaged in trying to um, uh, promote peace and monitor peace accords. But sometimes the peacekeeping forces that were sent to those countries engaged in their own businesses on the side that were fairly corrupt and exacerbated some of the tensions and kept some of the conflicts going. The third proposition is that the global war on terror increased foreign military presence in Africa and generated new external support for repressive governments. And um, this may be something that you want to ask me something about. Um, uh, you're probably familiar with some of the fallout of the foreign intervention in uh, Libya and how that um, uh, spilled over into Mali and other countries in the region. And some of those consequences, I think, could have been foreseen had people been more aware of the history and the culture of the region. Uh, so these are, the, these are the kinds of things that I'm hoping to, to raise in this book so that people understand, you know, what, what the, what the under, just understand the past so that they can control the present and predict the future better. And fourth, um, foreign intervention tended to exacerbate rather than alleviate African conflicts and to harm rather than help indigenous populations. And I would say that even international humanitarian and peacekeeping efforts were marred by conflicting interests of those who participated them in them, and that they sometimes hurt the people they were intended to assist. So this is, a, I, I guess this winds up being a fairly negative presentation, and, and it's full of cautionary uh, tales. Now, um, just to sort of differentiate a little bit about um, the, um, the kinds of intervention that occurred, um, different periods were characterized by different kinds of intervention. Um, during the Cold War and decolonization periods, the most significant intervention was extracontinental. Uh, and by that I mean the imperial powers su such as France, Britain, <coughs> Belgium, Portugal, um, and a few other um, smaller countries during the, the period of decolonization. And the Cold War powers of the United States, the Soviet Union, the People's Republic of China, Cuba, and um, the uh, Eastern Bloc allies. Uh, during the period of state collapse, the countries outside the African continent continued to implicate themselves in African affairs, often under UN auspices during the 1990s. Um, nonetheless, the most consequential intervention in Africa during this period was intra continental, that is African countries getting involved in one another's affairs as opposed to extracontinental. African governments, sometimes assisted by the extracontinental powers, supported warlords and dictators and dissident movements in neighboring countries, and they fought for control of their neighbor's resources. And here an example of that would be Rwanda, which is often championed as a model of economic growth and development post-genocide but which has used the resources of the Democratic Republic of Congo to do that. And that's often not discussed. Um, um, the African Union and regional bodies regularly intervene to broker, monitor, and enforce peace agreements, but their personnel sometimes profited from the strife. And in this case, one could point to the role of the West African uh, ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States, monitoring group in Liberia where neighboring states got involved in illicit diamond trading and um, you know interacted with warlords to try to control uh, those resources. And finally um, the war on terror extracontinental intervention has bec again become the most uh, salient form. Now before proceeding on to talk about the, um, the, the, the period that is the focus of the book I, I want to give a little bit of background and very quickly move over um, thousands of years of history leading up to the, the, the Cold War. Um, but um, what I do want to say is that Africa um, was never a continent that was isolated from the rest of the world. That it was not um, uh, the transatlantic slave trade or 
uh, conquest and colonization by Europe in the 19th century or colonialism uh, in the 20th century that brought Africa into uh, um, the world political economy, but rather Africa has been integrated with different parts of the world for thousands of years. And not all of that integration, not all of that engagement could be termed intervention. Um, and when I talk about intervention, I'm really talking about unequal power relationships uh, where uh, a more powerful country or series of countries engage with areas that are less powerful uh, and, and can succeed in imposing some of their will on those areas. But um, much of the African intervention um, that existed um, really uh, for even thousands of years before the Common Era um, um, it was um, uh, economic and commercial exchange. Uh, and so um, Egypt, for instance, participated in trade and communications that embrace, embraced the Persian Plateau, the Indus Valley, and lands as far away as China. And this was thou nearly 2,000 years before the Common Era. And you know, you could proceed on with the Phoenicians um, and um, um, uh, various other em empires that interacted with especially North Africa. World religions spread into Africa, and often that was done peacefully. Um, not everything was a holy war. Um, and so Judaism, Christianity, and Islam spread into Africa over a period of, of um, hundreds and thousands of, thousands of years, actually. Um, and uh, this began um, in the early years of the Common Era and, and continued. Um, then there were episodes of dispossession and loss of sovereignty uh, that can be termed intervention that long predated um, um, the, the period of conquest and colonization. Um, um, parts of Africa were forcibly incorporated into Persian, Greek, Roman, and Ottoman empires uh, before uh, the European conquest and colonization of the 19th century. There were externally driven slave trades. Um, we're all familiar with the transatlantic slave trade, but that was but not at all the only one uh, where African peoples were removed from the continent and taken <laughs> to other parts of the world in bondage. Uh, uh, there were slave trades that, that carried African people across the Sahara uh, to North Africa, to the Middle East. Uh, there were slave trades along the east coast of Africa, um, um, and then um, the, the more recent one being the transatlantic slave trade. Um, sometimes economic interventions pre precipitated uh, foreign intervention. Um, as the slave trade waned in the 19th century, the transatlantic slave trade waned, um, there was um, simultaneously um, the, the, um, the height of the Industrial Revolution in the West where Africa was perceived now as a site of important raw materials and um, um, uh, this uh, potential for new markets. And this, in turn, precipitated a great deal of tension between European powers that had had um, um, informal spheres of influence in different parts of Africa. And it was the fear of intra-European wars that stimulated the Berlin Conference in 1884-1885 that sparked the European scramble for Africa, where they they set up formal colonies and demarcated their own territories on a map. Um, and, and this uh, resulted in the conquest and colonization of Africa in the space of just a few decades. And so that period um, is what I think most of us are more familiar with. And it was, it was that, um, that type of intervention that was challenged, uh, especially after World War II um, and, and the beginnings of the period we call the, the decolonization period. Now, um, what happened in World War II uh, was that um, um, uh, um, the, the economic hardships of the war, the political promises of the war, the propaganda in, the favor, uh, in, in favor of democracy and popular participation and self-determination uh, really affected the ways in which colonized peoples felt about uh, their situation. Africans were conscripted. Uh, in the hundreds of thousands to fight in the European War. Um, and um, the, their experiences as, as soldiers uh, and um, you know, imbibing um, you know, the fight against the racism of the Nazis um, led them to become very disenchanted with 
um, their second class status, third class status, when they returned home. So veterans began to agitate, other people were agitating uh, against the economic hardships of the war. And eventually, um, European powers began to feel that the hassle and the expense of hanging on to their colonies might not be worth it. And um, uh, as they began to consider ways of granting political independence, they also began to fig try to figure out ways that they could retain economic and political influence without the hassles of direct colonial rule. Um, okay, now, um, The, uh, I've, so I've mentioned the European powers, I've mentioned the Cold War powers. A few others that um, I, I haven't mentioned as, as much, which I think is important, is uh, to uh, talk about some of the regional actors. Uh, in Southern Africa, I had mentioned the settler regimes of South Africa and Rhodesia and the, the occupation of Namibia by South Africa. And the white settlers in those countries were very adept at playing the Cold War card to attract support from um, the United States especially, but also Western European countries, and to portray agitation against white minority rule as being communist inspired, backed by Moscow, et cetera. And they were surprisingly successful in convincing Western governments um, um, and especially the United States that they had merit to their claims. Uh, and so the United States um, often found itself sometimes reluctantly but still supporting some of the white minority regimes uh, because of its fear of uh, communist influence. Okay. Um, Now, I do want to talk about, um, see, let me go back a little bit. Um, the in interventions during this period, um, um, the former colonial powers and the United States tended to support regimes that opposed communism and left economic relationships intact, even if they were corrupt and repressive. And this is something that we need to hang on to in terms of understanding the post-Cold War period. Um, at the end of the Cold War, um, Western powers, the United States, acknowledged the human rights abuses of many of their erstwhile allies during the Cold War. So this was the case in Somalia, this was the case in Zaire, which later became the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, the human rights abuses had been quite evident during the war. But the, the dictators, the strong men in charge of those countries had been very um, adept at serving as regional policemen um, who uh, kept a lid on radical nationalist movements in the region, uh, repressed any kind of radicalism within their own countries, and essentially served the interests of the, um, the Western powers during the Cold War. When the Cold War was no longer an issue, suddenly their human rights abuses became an issue. Um, and you know, many many critics, you know, felt that this was you know fairly hypocritical that that it, those abuses were there for all to see during the earlier years, but weren't really mentioned. Um, but in the post Cold War period, they were cut loose, and um, it was um, cutting off uh, support for those dictators that that helped to create the power vacuums that led to competition between internal pro democracy forces and uh, warlords and other autocrats who were moving into the power vacuums as well. Um, but during this period, in the post-Cold War period, um, 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 the, um, the, the West was really you know, not, not stepping up to the plate in the 1990s. Now, I do want to mention another um, important caveat um, although my book is really not about foreign economic intervention in Africa, the, the intrusion into African economies is an important part of the backdrop in terms of understanding the conflicts of the post-Cold War period. Um, first off, there were the colonial legacies in African economies. Um, um, during the colonial period, as I mentioned earlier, Africa was viewed as um, um, a site of raw materials, very valuable raw materials, whether it be minerals or cash crops, 
that could be extracted from Africa for the benefit of the imperial powers and for the benefit of the development of European economies. Um, the cash crops and the raw materials were sold uh, very cheaply to the, the mother countries. And in exchange, um, the uh, African territories imported manufactured goods, consumer goods, capital goods, from the mother countries uh, at much higher prices. So these uh, unequal trade relationships uh, were established, um, especially during the colonial period. Given the desire of the, the European powers to retain those kinds of economic benefits after political independence, they ten tended to favor the transfer of power to regimes that were willing to allow neo-colonialism, which is political independence, but the same economic dependence that they had previously experienced. So Africa generally was not industrializing uh, in, uh, after independence. So this is a problem, you know, uh, cheap exports, expensive imports. Then in the early 1970s, there was a, a, a crisis in um, 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 oil, price, oil prices, massive increases in oil prices, and um, the worldwide collapse of commodity prices uh, by the end of the 1970s. So here are African nations, um, many of them oil importers, uh, spending huge amounts of their revenues to import oil, but at the same time their exports of primary commodities have been reduced in value. Um, so they began to experience severe balance of trade deficits, which were compounded by the problems of inflated military budgets, corruption, and economic mismanagement. So by the 1980s, most African economies were in serious crisis. Now what do they do? Well, um, with few alternatives available, many African governments turned to the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, the World Bank, and Western governments and commercial banks for assistance. But this foreign aid that they sought came with strings attached. In order to get aid from these sources, they had to agree to implement free market reforms. And the free market reforms were aimed first and foremost at bolstering the strength of global capitalism and they were implemented by these Western dominated international financial institutions, the IMF the, and the World Bank especially. And they required um, what we refer to as stabilization and structural adjustment programs um, as a condition for foreign loans. And private banks generally required the IMF seal of approval before it would give loans. Many Western development agencies and international or not uh, non-governmental organizations also required um, that that the the countries abide by the IMF World Bank uh, structural adjustment programs before they would give loans. So essentially, what happened was um, um, the, the the Western powers that had the the finances um, um, catered to governments that were willing to. Um, to, to impose these structural adjustment programs, which meant getting government out of the economy, ending subsidies, um, imposing price, ending price controls and tariffs, and um, ending government subsidies generally resulted in undermining health and educational services and destroying social safety nets because these had been funded by the government. So as you might imagine, um, these structural adjustment programs were not very popular in African countries. They were losing what had been free health and education. There had been a, a dramatic expansion of primary and secondary education and, and basic health care services <coughs> after independence, and these had been financed by the government. And now the IMF and the World Bank is saying, no more. You know, you need to pay for health care, you need to pay for schooling, um, you know, you need to get out of the government. The government had also run a lot of industries as they were trying to get industrialization started. The IMF and the World Bank says, no, 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 the government should not be involved in the economy. These industries need to be privatized. But the problem with the privatization was that it didn't just go to uh, the most qualified people, but it began to um, 
exacerbate um, uh, a, a problem of crony capitalism, where uh, people with political power, people with um, uh, ties to um, those in the government um, were the ones who were the beneficiaries of privatization. The state owned industries and enterprises, uh, commercial enterprises, were transferred to um, the private hands of people with, with power. And so it exacerbated corruption. And it also did not mean that they were conducted you know, more efficiently, that, that these people were not necessarily trained. Um, the government also had to fire um, lots and lots of state employees um, um, because, again, the government shouldn't be involved in, in employing lots of people. And so doctors and teachers um, were amongst those who were, who were fired because they, they were part of the government uh, uh, personnel structure. Now, um, as I said, these, these reforms were not very popular, and so there were lots and lots of uh, protests. Uh, there was a lot of unrest in the 1990s as these programs were implemented, and the governments that did the best at implementing these programs were those that were the most repressive, that could crack down on the protests. Um, um, and so the result was that in the 1990s, um, um, there, there was, a, again, a preference on the part of the West for, for the governments that could make sure that these programs were, were implemented, whether or not um, you know, the, the, the ordinary citizens of these countries uh, were willing to um, uh, endorse them. Also, uh, the 1990s were a time of massive debt for these African countries. Um, um, the result of economic mismanagement, but also um, lots and lots of borrowing um, uh, for uh, military regimes, buying lots of military equipment that they really didn't need, and um, also a lot of money was um, pocketed by you know, the departing dictators at the end of the Cold War. Mobutu of Zaire was a, a case in point. And after the end of the Cold War, the, the countries, um, uh, the new governments were expected to pay off those debts, even though those debts had not benefited um, the, uh, the local population. So the debt crisis became extremely serious. Um, now, um, um, the result of, of this was um, a political and economic collapse. Um, many of the governments that had been important in the Cold War were now ousted. Um, um, you know, the popular uprisings against these government, the pro-democracy movements, in some cases uh, had some say in the governments that came to power, but more often than not, it was another scenario of um, warlords and autocrats replacing an earlier generation of warlords and autocrats um, and new forms of uh, intervention. Uh, in the 21st century, um, the uh, global war on terror and the struggle to secure the flow of oil and other strategic resources have put Africa back on the map. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware of um, um, the various counterterrorism initiatives in East Africa and uh, in West Africa, in the Sahel uh, of the United States Africa Command, um, and the attempt to uh, engage um, um, people from the State Department, USAID, um, the various branches of, of, of the armed forces in um, winning hearts and minds as, as a way of uh, countering um, um, some of the groups that, that um, are engaging in terror and trying to uh, win people away from allegiance to extremist movements um, by pr providing them with, with alternatives and, and ways to better their lives. But um, so far, um, um, many of these interventions have have um, um, resulted in um, um, counterproductive um, um, actions. You know, as, as I mentioned in the very beginning, um, the overthrow of Gaddafi in Libya resulted in massive numbers of uh, weapons flowing into um, Mali, Niger, and other countries, and um, um, members of his army uh, returning to northern Mali, where they had been engaged in insurgencies before and taking these weapons with them, uh, engaging in instability um, that resulted in um, the, the southern part of the country um, um, and the army um, engaging in a military coup. Um, the guy who, who led the coup was trained by the United States um, and, um, and, and ultimately um, the emergence of an Al-Qaeda faction 
uh, in, in, in Mali that had not previously been there. So um, I, think, I think that there are a lot of cautionary tales in terms of um, foreign intervention without um, adequate understanding of the history of countries or the aspirations of local people. And um, I, I don't think at this point the, the U.S. has learned the les lessons that it needs to about how to proceed for the future. So the purpose of my writing this book was actually not for scholars, but it was for undergraduates for non-specialists, for NGO people, for foreign policy makers who might not have read deeply about the history of the countries where there are current conflicts in order to understand um, the roots of some of those conflicts and the, the, the long history of foreign intervention that has resulted in some of the scenarios that we, that we see today. So as I said, I, I know this is sort of broad and I've mentioned some of the case studies that, that I cover in the book. So if you're, um, if you're more attuned to some of those case studies and want to ask specific questions about them, um, I'd be happy in the time remaining to try to, to zero in a little bit more on, on those details. Thank you. So as uh, Dr. Schmidt uh, mentioned, we have time for some questions. Who's first? Go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm uh, just one last question. My question is, um, part of South Africa has always been suspected as having nuclear weapons. Yes. And I was wondering, what do you believe that they did or didn't, and how did that affect its relations with other countries? I, I, I'm fairly convinced that they did. Um, and um, it's certainly um, made other countries in the region fear it more. Uh, apartheid South Africa was deeply engaged in destabilizing other countries, uh, especially Mozambique and Angola, where it supported anti-government rebel movements, um, but also to a lesser extent, Lesotho, Botswana, um, Zimbabwe, Zambia, uh, and of course the military occupation, political occupation of Namibia. Uh, so I think, I think it did cause other countries to fear them, but they were equally fearful of the conventional uh, South African Defense Force um, uh, weaponry, um, the boots on the ground, um, um, you know, invasion and occupation of southern Angola for many years. So I don't think that the, um, the nuclear bomb that it had was foremost in people's minds. It wasn't as immediate as the, you know, the South African Defense Force incursions. Um, and that technology, by the way, um, a lot of it had come from Israel. Um, um, in terms of helping to build the bomb. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's a that's a very good question. Um, the, Western involvement in Rwanda is, is really sticky and really complex um, because it goes back to before the genocide in 1994. Um, in, 19, in, in the 1990s, um, France was supporting the government in power in Rwanda that was the Hutu extremist government and its allies that were responsible for the genocide. And part of the reason France was doing that was it was worried about the encroachment of Anglophone interests, especially Uganda. And this has been one of France's great fears, um, uh, the role of the United States, Britain, and their allies in West Africa, and in this case, in Central Africa. And so despite the evidence that the Hutu extremists were planning for a genocide, um, uh, France kept giving them arms, kept supporting the government. Um, when the genocide began, and, and um, um, this was partially stimulated by an incursion of rebels who were Rwandan exiles who had grown up in Uganda, which was English speaking. So they, they, they were engaged in incursions. Um, the United States and other powers that might have been able to stop it made a big plea in the United Nations not to intervene because we didn't have strategic interest there. And um, after the genocide happened, there was a lot of remorse, I think, from countries that had not stopped it and had thwarted the UN from stopping it. And as a result of that, the government that came to power in Rwanda, 
which was the rebel movement that had stopped the genocide that had been based in Uganda, was able to play a lot on the guilt of the, the countries that didn't intervene so that um, um, it could do no wrong. And a blind eye was really turned to the uh, repression that's going on in Rwanda now. Um, very serious repression. I mean, they're going into the other countries and assassinating dissidents, like in South Africa, it's happened recently. Um, um, there are laws, um, you know, that if you deny the, the genocide or if you claim that there were also Hutu victims that you can get in trouble. Um, there um, is great denial that the government that came to power killed innocent Hutu civilians, which it did. Uh, but the, the biggest thing that I think um, you know, um, the West, the U.S. is ignoring um, is, is the, uh, really the rape of the Democratic Republic of Congo and the minerals there, the support of rebel movements there by Rwanda, and taking that back and getting involved in really horrific criminal networks to build R Rwanda. And so, you know, Rwanda, even in the New York Times just the other day, was being promoted as an economic su success story. You know, and they kind of, they, you know, they didn't like it to Botswana, but, you know, they might have, because they're looking at GDP, they're looking at high-tech industries that are being built, they're looking at, you know, uh, educational statistics, but they're not saying, where did this money come from? And it came from the Congo. And it, you know, it came from the people in the Congo, you know, where more than five million people have died since the late 1990s because of the wars in the Congo. Uh, many of those have not, they, they, weren't the, the, they did not die because of war violence, um, but they died as a result of disease and displacement and other things that are the direct result of the war. So how could we make it happen better elsewhere? I think part of it is to, um, you know, stop supporting some of the governments that are engaged in these kinds of practices and call a spade a spade. And, you know, we are often in the UN, uh, Susan Rice has been, you know, when she was the UN ambassador, um, she w would try to keep resolutions from being passed that, that, you know, criticize Rwanda for what it's done because as a young National Security Council staffer in the early 19, in 1994, she had been one of those voices who said, we can't call it a genocide. We're about to have an election. We can't get involved in these things. Um, so uh, there were a lot of American political interests that you know have gotten bound up in this. And um, um, you know, I know that governments are supposed to defend the, the interests of their country, but sometimes I think the interests are too short term in terms of how we see things. We're not looking at long term interests, and that maybe having Paul Kagame as an ally. Um, is not the best thing right now, um, um, that, that we maybe should be distancing ourselves. So I, I think you know, we could look at lots of different countries. Right now we're sending more um, special operations troops uh, uh, into Uganda to help fight Joseph Kony, who is, you know, he's an atrocious warlord, no question about it. But the Ugandan army has been engaged in atrocities in other countries, including the Congo. And they've been taking um, you know, the resources of the Congo back to Uganda. And so bolstering um, Museveni's army may not be what we ought to be doing right now. Right? So, so I, you know, that's sort of a long convoluted answer, but it's, it's again looking at the history of the countries to which we're giving military aid and looking down the road a bit to see what the implications might be. Um, yeah, and China is certainly one that, um, you know, um, uses its power on the UN Security Council to, you know, veto resolutions where um, some of the uh, abusive governments uh, where it's getting its minerals and its oil, you know, might be criticized and sanctioned and things like that. Um, China, China's intervention has been much more economic, though, than military. Um, um, and so, you know, I, I, I would draw that distinction. Um, um, it, like, you know, the colonial past, I mean, they're interested in, in you know, getting minerals, um, they're interested in getting oil. Uh, there are a lot of other countries, India, 
uh, Brazil, some of the countries, Arab countries in the Middle East, that are actually leasing land from African countries at really, really, really low rates. And these are countries where they're not producing enough food for their own people, but the people in power are making money by leasing land to outsiders. And so China's really not even the only one that's engaged in this, they're calling it the new scramble for Africa. Um, but China is a big, powerful country with lots of resources to invest. And one of the ways they're doing it is that they're building um, big infrastructure uh, projects, whether it be roads or dams or government buildings, uh, in exchange for long-term contracts that, that grant them access to these minerals and this oil uh, at really low prices. And so a lot of the African governments, which are not necessarily democratically elected, are saying, this is a great day, you know, because they're going to benefit. But the, the ordinary people aren't. Um, and there has been protest in some countries, Zambia is an example, um, South Africa are other examples, where um, people, small scale traders, whose goods have now become too expensive because of the influx of cheap Chinese goods, and so they're being driven out of business, or Chinese owned mines now in Zambia with horrible um, uh, labor conditions and, and people dying because of you know, the, the, the collapses of the mines, or textile industries that are again being established and, and, and t um, treating workers really badly and, and, and paying them really badly. Or I think just as importantly, China um, isn't hiring that many Africans to do to engage in these projects. They're bringing Chinese workers to do it because they're essentially exporting um, an unemployment problem. You know, how do we put all these people to work? Well, we'll take them to Africa and we'll build infrastructure projects. The West at least used to say, well, we're, at least we're providing jobs, you know, that, that Africans are building the roads and we may not be paying them very much and the roads may really be benefiting our industries more than anybody else, but they're getting some jobs. And China's not even doing that. Um, so it is very controversial, um, um, and, and, you know, and, and um, a lot of Africans are beginning to mobilize against it. Yeah, I saw a hand raised somewhere in the middle here. Still want to ask a question? One last one? Okay, okay. okay. you've asked a question already. Right? Okay. Yes. Um, third question. Thank you, Deputy Pratt, here. Um, I have a question about the Sierra Leone. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, you know, um, they they weren't they weren't taking um, resources from Rwanda. In fact, Sierra Leone was more the victim of resources being taken from it. Uh, so many of you have probably heard of Charles Taylor, who was the dictator in Liberia. Um, he was he's been tried in international tribunals not for his atrocities in Liberia, but for his atrocities in Sierra Leone where he was the primary backer of the, um, the Sierra Leonean rebel group um, that, that, that took over uh, Sierra Leone for a while and committed a lot of atrocities. And it's because he wanted to control the diamond bearing districts of Sierra Leone to bolster his own power in Liberia. Um, um, so uh, Sierra Leone um, um, probably, um, and, and here I, I must confess I'm not as up on the details as I might be, probably their own diamond riches are um, something that they can use to, to try to, to attract um, other kinds of wealth, that, you know, to, to attract foreign investment um, um, because they do have that wealth. Um, Liberia was, was a different case. Um, and um, um, unfortunately, the United States backed a lot of the Liberian governments um, that were engaged in a lot of this kind of brutality. Um, in Sierra Leone, um, it was more considered a British problem because it was, it was a British colony. The British did intervene in, in the final years of the war there and helped help to broker a peace. But um, it's, a different, it's a different case from Rwanda. Let's thank Dr. Schnitt yeah. for her time. Thank you.